We are reading again today Psalm 91. Psalm 91. A portion of scripture that many of us even know by heart. Psalm 91. Hallelujah. Psalm 91. May the Lord, are you there? Psalm 91. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver me, he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler or rampant. You shall not be afraid of terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in the night, in the darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Verse 7, a thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, in Jesus' name. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread on the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent, you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him in Jesus' name. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. In Jesus' name we read, amen. What a beautiful scriptures. Please have your seats. Beautiful portion of scripture, beautiful. So about two months ago, I get a call from Bible Society of Kenya. About 15 years ago, I was elected to sit in the board for Bible Society of Kenya. While in the board, the board itself, we elect the executive board. So among my peers, my colleagues in the board, they elected me to be among the four who sit in the executive board of Bible Society of Kenya. And I was honored to serve on that board for four years, representing the issues of young people in our country, Kenya. It's an honor. So this, this year, they asked me to lead the devotion in their AGM for this year. Oh, I was beyond myself. <laughs> I was blessed. I was like, wow. This is the essence of biblical tradition. And they've asked me to be, you know, to lead devotion. I was, I was honored. And they gave me the scripture. They said, our theme is now Psalm 91. So I got into reading Psalm 91. Let me prepare for the AGM for Bible Society of Kenya. I have seen the kind of people who lead those devotions. And, you know, I remove my heart and salute them. Heroes of faith in our, in our country and beyond. And in my head, I was like, wow. These guys have elevated me to their chores. I was blessed. So I began the journey of preparing this, <laughs> this sermon. So I read 91, the whole of it. So the first thing I learned is that the blessings of God are conditional. The blessings of God are conditional. Just like salvation is free, but you must accept it first for you to enjoy it for you to benefit from it, for you to be the recipient of that salvation, you must accept it. There is nothing that comes from God that is not conditional. Everything has a condition to it, attached to it. In the Garden of Eden, 
Adam was put there, created by God in that garden of Eden, but there was a condition. The condition to remain in that garden was the fact that you can eat any other fruit from any other tree. You can do whatever you want here. This is it. You, as long as you do not eat from that fruit of knowledge of good and evil. That was a condition. There is nothing from God that doesn't have a condition. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16. The Bible says this. And the Lord God commanded that man, say, commanded man, the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest therefore thou shalt surely die. There was no death before then. But when he ate that fruit, he died. Death came to earth. Condition to remain in the Garden of Eden and to enjoy the benefits and the privileges of the Garden of Eden was attached to one condition. Do not eat that fruit. That's it. Friends, there is nothing that is for free. But we are living in an interesting time. The devil knows that if, you say, if he says that the Bible is not true, we'll pick him up. If he says that prayer is not powerful, that's a lie, we'll pick it up. The word is true, there is power in the word. All that is true. In fact, he doesn't even encourage you not to pray because he knows, ah, you'll pick him up. But let me tell you something. Being busy is a lie of the devil in the 21st century and after. I don't know how many of you, we are in March, and some of you are wondering, how did we even get to March? Where did, where did February go? We are, in, we are at the end of March. I remember the other day, somebody walked into my office and said, by the way, you need to start signing checks. It's, it's the end of March. And I was like, what do you mean end of March? We just, March just started. You're talking about March. Where did February go? I remember in October, Sister Jemima was standing here and he said, it's October here. Where did the year go? How did we even get here? The, ma the year is, go we are three months down. I don't know how many of you are feeling like, Maze, you wake up like this, it's Monday, shortly it's Friday. You wonder, Allah? Where did Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday go? Anyone? Do you feel like time is flying faster than it did a few years ago? Where is time going? The truth is, time is the same. Time is constant. The problem is we are so busy that we are literally just, once in a while we come up for air and then you go back into the grind. I remember last year in, in, in December, the last week of November and the first week of, of, of December, I remember walking to the reception and asking Jennifer, can you push, from that week, can you push my appointment up and down so that you can create two days, I need a break. I feel like I need to come up for air. I am tired. I, need, I just need two days. And, and by the way, check in my leave days and see how many days do I have left. So Jennifer lifts her head and she says, for this year or last year? And in my head I'm wondering, what do you mean? And he says, you didn't take any leave days last year and you haven't taken any this year. And we're in December. And in my head I'm wondering, what do you mean? Where did 2023 go? How did the year pass and I didn't notice? Because you're literally every day. The, the day hasn't started and it's finished. As in right now, I'm sitting here. It's already a four-day week. Because there's Easter. Pardon? Yeah, yeah, there's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. As in the week is gone. There's no Friday. And some of you are feeling like, Maze, I wish Easter was the following week. <laughs> I'm not alone. <laughs> you're supposed to be happy that it's Friday, but some of you are like, oh my God, it's less. The week is short by one day. 
And we bless the Lord that Jesus came, he died, and he rose again. We need to walk. You see, friends, at that point when I was asked by Bible Society to lead the, in, the devotion and lead Psalm 91, it wasn't about the people who would come. It was about God speaking to me about Psalm 91. And it's a psalm I have read for years. I know it backwards. As in their placards, their wall hangings, their bumper stickers about Psalm 91. It's all over the place. It's one of our favorite chapters in the Bible, Psalm 91. So what is it about Psalm 91? So I go back and I start now picking verse 1 with a toothpick. And it says, He who dwells. And so I go back and I Google the word dwell. And the meaning of the word dwell is home, flat, or house. A place of dwelling. Now, you can only call some place home because that's where you go home. That's home. And home is not something you go to once in a while. It's, it's where you go. That's where your family is. A place of safety. A place of peace. It's a place of protection. That's where you go to, to put your hair down, so to say. It's a place where you remove your shoes and you wear that T-shirt. You, you know that T-shirt of yours that you, the T-shirt, Sengenge ni. Simitini Potla. You know, I, I don't know if you guys have that T-shirt, but me, I have that T-shirt. You know, you come home and I ask her, where is my T-shirt? And she's wondering, that drawer is full of t-shirts. No, I'm saying that one. Which one? You know what I'm saying. Oh, the old one. <laughs> it's mine. And where is my short? Because there's a short that I wear when I go home, and I feel like I'm sitting on the throne. <laughs> After you shower, you know, if you eat ugali without that t-shirt, it doesn't go to the right side of the stomach. <laughs> Do you guys have those clothes? You have those ones, eh? So I'm not alone. Right at home. So that T-shirt that is at home. That T-shirt that is, at, is at home. That's where home is, where that T-shirt is. That's home. And that's what the Bible is saying. He who's home, he who's home is where? Is in the secret place. Now, when the Bible says secret, secret is not a public place. Secret is a place that is not known by many. It's a place that is just you. It's not for everyone. It's a secret place. Have you ever noticed, if you have enough to have a safe in the house, you don't put a safe in the sitting room. You know, you don't walk in and right there on the door there's a safe. No, it's a kept secret. There are things that you keep secret. So the Bible is saying that place that is secret, that is not a public place. It's a place for you alone. It's not known to everyone. That's why it's secret. The Bible here is saying, he whose home is in the secret place of the Most High. That secret place belongs to God. That secret place. God has a secret place for each one of us. When you make your home in that secret place, when you make your dwelling, he who, he who dwells, he whose home is in the secret place of the Lord, benefit, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That man, that woman, who makes the place of the Lord home, that secret place, shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Now, shadow, there must be something that is blocking. For you to create a shadow, there must be, you know, something that is bigger than you, that is protecting you from the element. So that you're protected. You are, you, when you are sitting in the shadow of something, it means that it's larger than you, it's all over you, and you can sit there and it's protecting you from, from the elements, from the heat. He's saying that you will abide 
in the shadow, under. You will be protected by the Almighty. Because in his shadow, the shadow of the Almighty. So I started asking myself, have I made the place of prayer my home? Or is prayer something I do to tick a box? And I started searching my heart. Let me tell you a story on Tuesday, this last Tuesday. Now, I love prayer. I've taught about prayer. Prayer and fasting is a popular thing that I like to do. And I teach about prayer and fasting. And I know the power of prayer and fasting. So on Tuesday, for those who are visiting, River of God on Tuesday is our day of prayer and fasting. So we fast and pray on Tuesday. Wherever you are, you miss a meal or two, but you spend that time in prayer. That's our culture as a church, and it has been for 15 years. So on Tuesday is prayer and fasting, but that same Tuesday, this last Tuesday, I, have, I've been inv I had been invited to a pastor's conference. And this pastor's conference is about people who are interested in coming up or developing programs for special needs people. And for me, that was an answer to prayer because we are just about to finish our building. The physical, cons uh, the, the physical uh, structure is done, and so we are starting to think about what do we do with the rooms, and you know, that's the next meeting that is happening with the board, with the building committee, and the contractor is up there, he's asking. So we need all the drawings and stuff, and so I was like, this is an answer to prayer. Just when we are you know, we want to start building in, and we have decided as a church that we will have an entire room for special needs. And so, this meeting was crucial for me, but it was on Tuesday in the morning, and it was a breakfast meeting. And so, I wake up at 5, because the meeting is at Sarova Panafric, and it's at 7. And because of where we live, I had to wake up at 5. And I woke up my son, because he is doing his internship near there, and I said, hey, my son, we are going together. And he says, yes, Kwani, where are you going? I have a breakfast meeting at Sarova Panafric. Wow! So they are serving breakfast. I say, yeah, it's a breakfast meeting. <laughs> then I reminded him, but today is prayer and fasting. He was like, ah, yes. So anyway, what he didn't know is that in my head, from the point I woke up, all I was thinking about is the bacons, you know that guy who makes the eggs and he asks you, how do you want your eggs? <laughs> and, you spay, and you say Spanish with a touch of chili. You know that guy? And then you go to the pancake guy and he makes those two nice pancakes that you just breathe them in. <laughs> I don't know where they go. You don't even chew. You just... <laughs> and then you go to those beans. You know those two beans that you pick kidogo? And those, those two tomatoes that are chomeka da bit. You know those tomatoes, those ones? <laughs> and then you go to the potato place with those two potatoes and, and they, have a, they are not too dry. They're just nice and they have onions. And, you know, and, and I'm telling you from five. <laughs> that's all I'm thinking about. Why am I thinking? Because today is prayer and fasting. Now I'm thinking how I can, how, how am I going to deal with this and, and still fast and pray? How can I eat and still fast and, and pray? And, and I'm it might not be a big thing for you, but for me, it was a physical struggle. I am telling you, I struggled from five when I woke up to seven, to a few minutes to seven as I was walking in with my son. I was just thinking about those big ones. I walked in and, and I walked in. And they were not, and, and you know, Kenyans don't keep time. So, so the guys who came in before seven were just me and another guy, and of course, the facilitator. So I, I come in and Pastor Nick says, Ah, Pastor, Bishop, how are you doing? Thank you for being here on time. Please sit on that table. So I move there and I meet this bishop. He's a nice guy. I sit next to him. And eventually people trickling in and I'm sitting next to my son and I'm introducing my son and they're excited. Oh, this man brought his son. And of course, guys come in. Ah, I saw you. I saw you a clip. Ah, bishop. Ah, eh. you know. And uh, yeah, I'm signing autographs. Anyway, nothing like that. <laughs> yeah, I wish. <laughs> So anyway, 
The meeting begins. And Nick goes up there and he says, hey, we have critical mass, so let's pray for breakfast. And in my heart, I'm like, maze. Anyway. So we all stand. He finishes to pray and he says, breakfast is on that side. And now they uncover those things. You can hear the cutlery moving. And I'm in my heart, I'm wondering, oh my God. So anyway, we all walk towards that direction. And I'm still thinking, you know, I've been taking some medicine. But what if an ROG guy comes in and is like, <laughs> and you know ROG people, I know you. You'll just look at me and <laughs> there is pasta fasting. <laughs> chicken wings. You know, those two brown chicken wings. I don't know what they make them with, but they just melt it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in my head, I started wondering why I even came. So anyway. Everybody went towards that side. And I can see the egg guy, I can see those things. And, and so me, I walk slowly, and I'm just trusting God, remember my sacrifice, <laughs> towards the coffee side, so that I can grab my cup of coffee and walk back. So anyway, by the time I get back, everybody's plate must be, because there's a guy there, he has like half a kilo of bacon. Maze <laughs> Joe. Then I'm looking at his plate and I'm like, you know, don't look, don't look, don't look, just don't look. So I'm just chonjo here so that I don't drool, because all I'm doing is swallowing saliva here. So anyway, this guy on the other side, he starts digging in his coolard kidogo bacon, because he starts with the, you know, precious commodity. <laughs> and then he turns and he says, Allah, why are you not eating? Bishop, are you fasting? And he doesn't say it quietly, he says it loud. <laughs> Are you fasting? So everybody's like, let me see the guy who's fasting. <laughs> and in my head, I'm wondering, why am I feeling embarrassed? It's my problems that have brought me here. But in my heart, I'm trying to wonder, what problems are these? There are so many that I can't eat. <laughs> so anyway... So I sit there, the meeting is supposed to go until 10 o'clock, but uh, yeah, seriously speaking, after 9, me, I couldn't take it. I just stood up and left. Said, I'm, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. So anyway, I went, and I went to church. I came, I came to church. And while I'm going down the stairs, I'm wondering, but I've, I've told them to park for me. I couldn't believe that food had such a hold on me. I'm telling you, I was de de I'm walking towards the car and I'm wondering, how my waiter will go up? And these guys, you know, I'm a bishop. Take away. <laughs> but I'm like, who's fooling who? And it's at that point I remember that I think I've lost it. And let me tell you why. God reminds me about my wife, Carol, and her friend, Marcy. Carol and Marcy have been friends since they were in class one. They met in class one. And they've been friends since. They talk every day. They, write, they used to write each other letters in high school. In primary school, they would pass by each other's house on your way to school and from school. They've been friends since. And many of you here can testify that Carol and Marcy are friends. My kids can testify that mom's best friend is Marcy. Marcy's kids can testify that my mom's best friend is Pastor Carol. I can tell you without fear of contradiction. After we have prayed, the last person my wife talks to is Marcy. The first person Pastor Caro talks to after we have prayed is Marcy. As in they are always talking to each other. If we are on Mombasa Road, chances are we shall go to Marcy's house. And in my head I'm wondering, Caro, you are on the phone with Marcy. What are we going to do in her house? As in you haven't even hung up. She's just, she, she was talking to Marcy and then she says, Ebu, Ebu, hold on. Can we go into Marcy's house? Can, can we just pass by? Just for two minutes. And of course I know there is not two minutes in Marcy's house. As in... 
I am sure there are people who think we still live in South Bay because of how many times you go to Mercy's house. And the Lord now is challenging me. Now I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm asking myself, seriously speaking, if you look at my day timer, if you look at my diary, would there be evidence to support the fact that the place of prayer, the dwelling, the secret place of the Lord is close to me? Would my diary show my prayer life? Would it reflect my relationship with God? So I, I went to look at the benefits in Psalm 91. Because remember, the blessings of God are conditional. So before we claim them, let's ask ourselves, he, who, so he whose home, you know, Scripture says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. He, is, he who, whose home is in the secret place of the Most High will do what? Shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So the Almighty will be your, his shadow will be your protection. I will say, the Bible is saying, that I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. He is my fortress. He is my refuge. Now, for you to say that God is your fortress and God is your refuge, we go back to verse 1. And what does verse 1 say? He says that he whose home is in the secret place of the Lord shall say, he is my fortress and my refuge. So now we move from there and we go to the diary. And we see, what does the diary say? It says, busy, 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 busy. And no God anywhere. Because we are living in a generation that glorifies ability, not dependability. It's our ability to do, not our ability to depend on God. You see, many of you here today can testify that where I am, it is purely God. But you see, the world doesn't care about what you think. The world is consumed. In fact, the world is drunk because we celebrate the four-point roadmap. If you come up, oh, tell us about your success, and you have a four-point journey they will shut up the entire organization and call everybody. And I want you to listen to the four points of how to succeed in the financial world or in the manufacturing world. This guy has succeeded. Look at what he has been able to achieve. Give us your four points. And we celebrate our four-point roadmap more than the ability to trust in God. Yet we know that without God, when the mud hits the fan, God is all we have. And we are where we are because God made a way for us. But if you told someone, when they come and they are celebrating you and they are seeing your achievements, and you say, I don't know what else to tell you but God, I don't think they'll give you a listening ear. In fact, they'll think you're so selfish you don't want to tell them the secret behind your success. Everything in Scripture is true. And it's a blessing and we desire more of it. Verse 3. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Verse 3. He will surely deliver you from the hunter's snare, from the destructive plagues. We desire that. We desire to be delivered by the Lord. With his feathers, he will cover you under his wings. He will, you will find safety under his wings. His truth is your shield and armor. You want to be covered by, with his wings. The way a chicken covers its cheeks under the wings and protects them from the elements and from the enemy, from the, from the, from the eagles and, and the cats and the dogs and, and the chicken with the feathers and its... It's a dangerous thing to try and approach a chicken when it has its chicks. It covers them under the wings. And that's what the Bible is saying, that God will cover you like a chicken covering his chicks with the wings. 
But who is that who is covered by the wings of God? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. That's the one who will be covered, who will enjoy the benefit of being covered by the feathers. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. Shall run like the chicks run to mother chicken. They run and they hide. And the Bible here is saying that when you are oppressed and pressed down, and when you are overwhelmed, you will run under the wings of the almighty God and take refuge there. A place of safety. If you have made your dwelling, your home, in the secret place of the Most High. You shall not be afraid. By night, you shall not be afraid by night. You need not fear terror that talks in the night, the arrow that flies by day, plagues that strike in the darkness, or calamity that destroys at noonday. If a thousand fall at your side or 10,000 at your right hand, it will not overcome you. Verse 8, only observe it with your eyes and you will see how the wicked are paid back. We desire, we, we quote that scripture. See like what is happening in Haiti. When you're watching it at the comfort of your house, you don't go to bed in fear. Because of the bullets and the bombs and, and the anarchy on the streets of Hawaii, ha, 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 Haiti. You don't. Why? Because it's far away. And the Lord is saying that that's how you will see calamity. From a distance you will see to the eye and it shall not come near you. And we quote that portion of scripture, don't we? But what does it say? For you to benefit on that. What is the condition? The condition is, if he that dwelt in the secret place of the Most High, he that makes his home in the secret place of the Most High. Then you shall, this will be your portion. Lord, you are my refuge. For you to be able to say, Lord, you are my refuge. Verse 9. Because, it is because you have chosen the Most High as your dwelling place. The psalmist is repeating, he's just reminding us, hey, just a minute, before we go too far, remember, remember the condition. For you to say that he is my refuge, for you to say he's my refuge, you, you must choose the most high as your dwelling place. Verse 10, no evil will fall upon you and no affliction will approach your tent. <laughs> we love that portion of scripture, don't we? But for you to be able to say no evil confidently will fall upon you and no affliction will approach your tent. It is because you have made the dwelling. You have made your home in the secret place of the Most High. For he will command his angels to protect you in all your ways and with their hands they will lift you up so you will not trip over a stone. You will stamp on lions and snakes. You will trample young lions and serpents. Because he has focused his love on me, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. He, when he calls out to me, verse 15, this is the one that now got to me. It says, he who makes his dwelling in the secret place of the Lord, when he calls me, when he calls out to me, I will answer him. The Lord is saying, when you call, he will answer you. I will be with him in his distress. And right there, I began to cry. When you call and you're in distress, you want to be heard. 
you desire to be heard. When you're in distress and you call, you want to be heard. One of the frustrations about the Kenya police force is that when you're in distress and you call, they don't show. The one thing that when you call for an ambulance, you type 999, sometimes it doesn't even go through. When you call for the fire brigade, it doesn't show. By the time they come, the stories are endless. When the homes have been gutted down, the businesses are gone, all the property is lost. And we are frustrated. You want to know that when you call in distress, someone will answer. And that's when I broke down. That when you call out, and I call out to God in distress and say, God, remember so and so. He will answer if I have made my dwelling in his presence, in the secret place. And now the Lord is speaking to me saying, you are busy doing for me. And what I want you to do is be with me. Not do for me, is be with me. And many of us are busy. That's why the ear goes and you wonder where did it go? Because we are busy doing and we are not being with him. Yet it is him who gives us the ability to do everything that we do. If he closes that door, and he's closed. I've told you the story, and I pray, and I hope, and I've told you before, there's a book that I would recommend you buy, and that book is called Chasing Daylight. This top CEO of the top, one of the top four, Accounting firms, global. And this guy is the CEO of the global organization. And they're having a conversation with his wife. I read it a while back. And he goes into the doctor's clinic. And this is a guy who the previous year, he paid three, the bonus is $345 million. Bonus, a million shillings for every year, for every day lived. That's his bonus, $365 million. As in he has a private jet allocated to him. He has a driver and a limo in every continent, in every country he goes to. He walks into a doctor's clinic and the doctor says, just a minute, you have 100 days to live. The first doctor says you have three months. The other doctor says you have 100 days to live. He hasn't even touched the $365 million for the previous year. And here the doctor is saying he has 100 days to live. What do you mean? I have a few heads of state to meet. I have appointments in a jet somewhere. We'll be flying all over the world doing meetings and writing checks that would make the Kenyan economy look like pocket change. And here a doctor is saying you have 100 days to live. You have a tumor growing in your head, and it's inoperable. We cannot operate. And right there, the first thing he did is resign. The first thing he did is resign. And that's where he wrote the book, Chasing Daylight. Literally, he's chasing daylight because he only has 100 days to live. You see, friends, it's not about doing. It's about being with him because it is him who gives you the ability to create wealth but we are busy doing for him rather than being with him he died before the hundred days so the last chapter is actually the, f the final part of that book is actually written by his wife who is already dead the bonus didn't count when the mud hit the fan it's the important things that counted. He started in 30 years. In 30, this guy was so busy. In 30 years of being the CEO of this organization, he had lunch with his wife twice. In 30 years. Twice. Because he's in a jet somewhere. 
twice. But in a hundred days, he had lunch with his wife every day. The mud had hit the fan. He had been slowed down. God was saying, hey, I need your attention. You see, God is not impressed with your title and your bank balance or what people think about you. He's just interested in the fact that he who makes his home in the secret place of the Almighty, of the Lord, shall abide, shall remain, because abide is a place where you stay, shall stay in the shadow of the Almighty. He is God. Let me tell you another story. So a few, many years ago, I have two prayer, prayer partners. One is called Timothy, and he died. Timothy Ruga, my prayer partner, he died. My other prayer partner is called Joseph Gaido. He, he's in the transport industry. So me and Joseph had agreed that we need to be spending more time in prayer. And so he, he said that he would be going to Aboretum to pray. And he had been going to Aboretum to pray. This one Saturday, he woke up late. Because for you to get a seat in Aboretum on Saturday morning, you have to go early to get the choicest seats. You know, there are seats where it doesn't matter whether the sun is rising or setting, you are covered. The, the shade is nice and the seat is nice and they're near the toilets. And so people go there very early and book those seats. So by the time he was getting to Aboretum, he realized, you know what? Today I won't go because it's already 9 o'clock. I'm sure all the seats are taken. And now if the seats are taken, even the nice places where grass is there, there are so many people, there are people picnicking, there are churches, there are groups. So he figured, you know what? <laughs> I'll go another day. Or let me find another, spot, another place to go pray. But he felt in his heart he still needs to go. So he decides, you know what? Ah, kisera, sera, I'll go. So by the time he's getting there, it's about 9.30. Is when he's getting to Aboretum. So he pays, and he walks right up that car road all the way towards the left. That's where the trees and the nice forest cover is. And he knew there is no way his favorite seat would still be unoccupied at 9. So he's walking, and he's wondering why there is this desire in his heart to just go to the same place. And anyway, he goes. But from a distance, he can tell the city is empty and he's wondering, how come? He can see all these people around, there are people praying, there are people in picnic, but no one has put their things on the seat. So he decides to walk all the way there. He gets to the city, looks around, he looks around, he's wondering, how come no one is sitting? And he sits. And he doesn't even open his Bible. He sits for a few minutes to just see if somebody will come and say, hey, I was here earlier. And no one shows. When he opens his Bible and he prays, he starts to pray. He hears the Lord say, I was waiting for you. I'd save the seat for you. And he, all he did was cry. The entire day, he just, he wasn't able to pray or, or read. He just cried. He just broke down. At the thought that he almost didn't come. Yet God was waiting for him at the seat to hear what he would say. You see, friends, the Lord's desire is to spend time with us. But many of us, even in our prayer time, is ticking a box. I prayed for an hour to tick a box. It's not to have fellowship. Yesterday, when I was coming from the funeral, we, we left home at 5.30. So we woke up at 4 or just before 4 to go to the funeral. And we were there the whole day. I was standing and halfway at some point I had to leave to go to, to, uh, to the AGM. I preached there and then I left and I had to drive all the way to, to, uh, to, to Tala where the funeral was. And you know it's hot, I'm wearing a suit, I'm in a collar, I'm boiling inside. You know, it's here with water. They, you know, I just, <laughs> it was a long day. And towards the tail end, just about five o'clock, the, the general superintendent, my bishop comes and he says, don't leave this man here. Make sure he gets home. And in my head, I'm like, okay. So anyway, by the time they finalize everything and we get to his house, it's nine o'clock. 
And at that time, I'm feeling like my, sh my feet have grown to a double size. My shoes are pressing. I feel like my shirt is stuck. I, I just want to get home, shower, and sleep, because tomorrow we have to wake up at 4. I just want to go home. That's all I wanted to do. And then when I was there, there's this little young girl. I don't know what possessed me to just walk to her and say, I can see everyone is going. So I just turn and say, by the way, how are you going home? <laughs> and when she tells me, I say, so, so what's your plan? <laughs> and have you ever seen those questions you wish you didn't ask? But I did. And now I have to drop her all the way home. And I remember as we were going home, Marcy just looked at how tired I was. He says, it's okay, Percy. When you drop me home, I'll get her an Uber. I just turned and said, thank you. So by the time I was getting home, it was past 10. I don't want anyone to talk to me. I just want to remove my shoes. I felt like I wanted to throw them away. In fact, I remember from Marcy's house, I removed my shoes. I opened the windows. I just... I just want to be, <laughs> I felt like, I just want to go home. I, I know now why children cry. <laughs> if I was a child, I'd have cried. <laughs> but I'm telling you, all the way on Mombasa Road, coming down on Thika Road, on Kiambu Road, you know, I, I, was, I was feeling like, when will I get home? But when I got to the gate, there was a sense of relief. When I opened the gate and I drove in and I closed the gate and I walked in, I removed my shoes, actually carried my shoes from the car, threw them out there, started removing my collar on the door. You know, it's just unbuttoning the shirt straight to the shower. I don't want people to talk to me. I don't want anyone to ask me how the day was. I just feel overwhelmed. I just want water. You know, it's those days we just want to own and you just stand there and say, God, thank you for this privilege. I felt, after I showered, I was happy. It's like life came back. It was like a short of life. And you know, this morning, God is asking me, do you hunger for me? Do you desire me as you, de as you desired your shower last night? Yet God's relief is better than the relief of the shower last night. And I have been busy serving him. But the Lord was reminding me, for you to call when you're in distress and I answer, then make your dwelling in my secret place. And I'm challenging you today to resolve in your heart that I will find God, that I will find my home in his presence, that I will train my heart to hunger for him. As a deer pants for streams of water, so my heart shall hunger for him. As a watchman desires for morning, so will my heart hunger for God. May we be the church that sought after God. And that you can't pretend. And it's a personal thing. It's not a corporate thing because it's at the secret place where you go home and you wake up at three and, and you go to your secret place. Not to tick a box, but to share the desires of your heart. I'm praying for the day when I come to church in the middle of the night or at some point and I'll find someone here where you're saying, you know what, I just want to come to this altar and, and spend time in the secret place and make my dwelling in his house. And it won't be an event, it will be a way of life. I pray that one day we'll get to a place where I will see a man or a woman who will bring their children to church and say, you know what, today rather than go for picnic, why don't we go and, and sit at the feet of our Lord as a family? That you will come and everyone will take their corner and you just want to be in his presence. In his presence, there is fullness of joy at your right hand. 
They are precious evermore. You surround us with your favor, O Lord. The earth is filled with your goodness. The earth is filled with your love. I have purpose that I will find him. So the day when I'm in distress, when I call him, he will answer. Because I know that day is coming. Because it's not about him, serving him, and doing for him. It's about being with him. May we find God. Because that day of distress is coming. May he answer you. May he answer you. May he answer you. Because you have made your home in the secret place of the Most High. And in his shadow shall we abide. In Jesus' name. Let's stand on our feet. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you for every one of us here today. May we be the generation, may we be the church, may we be the family, may we be the men and the women who make our dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. The Lord, our hearts, because that we cannot manufacture, but we shall train our hearts to desire for you. That the world will look and desire our relationship with God, our friendship with our maker, Father, in Jesus' name, may we raise our relationship with you to the next level. Where, Lord, we desire for more of you. The Lord, you bless the works of our hands, that your favor will surround us, almighty God, that we shall see you, we shall hear your voice, you shall heal our bodies and grant us peace, the peace that surpasses human understanding. Jehovah, in the name of Jesus Christ, for this far, you are God alone and there is no other but you. We love you, Lord, and we desire for more of you. Blessed be your holy name, that we shall hunger and thirst for you. In Jesus' name. So as you live today, may the Lord shine his face upon each one of you. May his favor be evident over your life. May none of your bones ever be broken. May what is yours that the devil has taken or touched. May our God in heaven pay you back a hundredfold. May the peace of God that surpasses human understanding, may that peace fill your hearts. And may the joy of the Lord fill and saturate every inch of your home. May it be your portion. Remember in your tongue you have the power of life and death. Declare life of the issues that surround your life, over the nation of Kenya, the nation of Israel, and as the Lord may lead you. And on every road you travel on, declare that on this road today, within or without this country, on this road today, no one will lose their life or have their property destroyed. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. May the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel go with us. Amen.